Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. I can hear you, Mark. Okay. I have the the other background screen from the uh, uh, prior town hall. Do you want me to use that? Because for some reason I'm not. I can't get the uh, the blur to work on the Zoom. You can do that if you want, or you can just leave your regular background. Like whatever Kaylin would prefer. Uh, it did, Mark, are you in your office? Yeah, well, at my home. <laughs> uh, let's go with the um, the old town hall uh, background. And okay. a heads up that we are live streaming on all our platforms. Okay. I think Pastor Lambert has the best background. I'm trying to figure out how to blur it in Zoom and I'm doing a poor job. I think you I think it looks just great the way it is. Okay, then I will leave it alone and stop feeling so technologically challenged. Ah. It's perfect. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Nancy Backus, and I am proud to be your mayor of the city of Auburn. And tonight's town hall is centered on the Auburn Police Department and our community. Now, we most likely are not going to be able to get to all the topics that you might like to hear about in the next two hours. But please know that this is not going to be the only discussion and that there will be more opportunities forthcoming. I'd like to jump right into introducing the panel this evening and then we'll move right into the discussion. For those of you watching live, you will have the opportunity to submit your questions. And even if you don't have an opportunity to hear your question answered tonight, there is always email, 
There is always phone calls. There will be many, many other opportunities on social media as well. Uh, we have a very strong presence on social media. You can always ask those questions at that time as well. So I will start this evening with our chief, Dan O'Neill. Dan, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, Auburn. My name is Dan O'Neill. I'm the current chief of the Auburn Police Department. Uh, I've been with the Auburn Police Department. Uh, it was 22 years ago, uh, two days ago. I started on July 6, 1999. Um, prior to coming to the Auburn Police Department, I attended Eastern Washington University where I graduated uh, with a degree in criminology uh, and then got into policing. Uh, during my time uh, here at Auburn, I worked primarily graveyard patrol as a generalist canine handler. Um, and then I became a sergeant in 2010, uh, worked in all the divisions within the department to include investigations and property crimes. Um, and then uh, became a commander in 2017 and became the interim chief at the end of 2019 and got uh, appointed in uh, March of 2020. Thank you, Dan. And Assistant Chief Mark Callier. Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Callier. I'm the uh, Assistant Chief here in Auburn. Uh, I've been a police officer for just a little less than 30 years now. Um, I came to Auburn in 1994. Uh, I am a 1991 graduate of Washington State University with a degree in criminal justice. Um, my general duties here, I oversee the daily operations of the police department, uh, including every uh, division here, our records division, our support services, detectives and patrol. Um, I help uh, basically make sure that the vision of the chief of police is carried out on a daily basis. Excellent, thank you. And Commander Christian Adams. Hello, I am Commander Adams with the Auburn Police Department. I've been with the department for uh, just over 15 years. Uh, I spent time as a patrol officer, a detective. I'm a currently a defensive tactics instructor. Um, I was a sergeant for a couple of years and now I'm a commander, happy to be in the city. Thank you. And the newest member of our Auburn Police Department family, our new uh, Public Information Officer Colby Crossley. Good evening, everyone. That's right. I am the newest member. I've been here a whole three weeks, so uh, the other guy's got a few years on me, but uh, I am the new Public Information Officer with the Auburn Police Department. For my time here, I have been a reporter for the past five years. I was in Bozeman, Montana for two, and then Colorado Springs for about three years. Before that, I graduated from Washington State University with a degree in journalism. That all led me to here. Thank you, Colby. And our final panelist for this evening, uh, probably a, a man that doesn't need much of an introduction, but I am going to start out with happy birthday, my friend. Uh, I just realized that today is your birthday and what a gift you are giving to us by sharing your evening with us on this topic when you could be spending it with your family. That just speaks volumes to your commitment to our community. So thank you so much for being here. And if you'd like to share a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, Madam Mayor, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this discussion. Uh, my family is at home eating now, and I'm sure they'll enjoy the meal. But tonight, after Chief O'Neill contacted me, I appreciated uh, his desire to have community involvement in this discussion about police and policing in our city. Uh, my wife and I came to Auburn because we knew we were supposed to, felt there was a divine mandate three years ago, actually three years ago and one week ago, we came up here because we believe that Auburn has great potential to be a beacon of light to our nation, where it's becoming increasingly diverse, which leads to a, a great number of new challenges for the city that after my time um, speaking with our mayor, our chief of police, the police department, our city council and other leaders in our area, I believe we're up for it and we're gonna see change, but it's gonna require more of the openness that we've seen behind, uh, behind closed doors and in, in meetings. I believe when the people hear that the work is being done, many of the fears will go away. We have a lot of work to do, but after my time with Chief O'Neill and our, our mayor and uh, C Commander Betts and Commander Adams, I have great faith in the men and women that are doing the work to bring Auburn to a place where we can stand and say that we are truly united not just on special days, but as a community, one people. And Madam Mayor, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much and happy anniversary on 
becoming a, a member of the Auburn community, we are we are fortunate that you chose Auburn as the place to to share your gifts. And Chief O'Neill, happy happy 21st anniversary or 22nd anniversary plus a day plus a couple of days. Uh, your anniversary date in the city is similar to mine. My first day on the city council was July 7th, 2003. So uh, a lot of uh, a lot of anniversaries and birthdays and celebrations right now. But let's get right into some of the questions that we have for this evening. And as you mentioned, uh, Dan, you were named interim chief in December of 2019, and you were formally appointed in March of 2020. Uh, May I say that your timing is impeccable on, on taking over as police chief right at the beginning of a pandemic and also at a time in our country uh, that was in a great deal of turmoil, especially with the uh, death of George Floyd. Either one of those two large topics on its own would be more than enough, but you uh, you took on uh, the role of chief at a time when our country was in a great deal of turmoil. In the, in the summer of 2019, uh, while you were a commander, we contracted with McGrath Consulting Group to conduct a police retention study for the Auburn Police Department. And Dan, I don't need to tell you that the results of that study were not all that great. The turnover in our department was high, the morale was low. And when that study came back, McGrath provided some recommendations to the city for how to move forward. You inherited that study, you inherited those results and immediately went to work on the recommendations that were put in that report. Can you share your thoughts on that study and then what you did to implement some of those changes and, and make changes of your own? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I want to uh, say happy birthday to Pastor Lambert. I didn't realize it was your birthday today. And uh, thanks for being here on such a special day for you. Um, so when the McGrath report came in and we got the results of that, uh, we had lost 16 officers that year. And uh, the thing that really stood out to me was the fact that 85% of the employees in the department um, cited leadership as the biggest concern and biggest uh, issue within the agency. Um, additionally, they provided, I believe it was uh, like 41 recommendations on things that we could do uh, to improve the overall uh, culture of the agency and the organization. Um, prior to uh, becoming chief, I had some ideas of my own that, uh, you know, and I think we all keep a list that if we're ever the person in charge one day, these are the things that we're going to do or the changes we're going to make or the um, projects we're going to implement. Um, but when I took over, I, I think I really needed to get to work on uh, changing the leadership of the organization. Um, I believe that if you take care of your employees and you have good leadership, uh, they will go out and take care of our citizens and our community. Uh, so that was my top priority. I also inherited a command staff that had two vacancies. Uh, we were down two commanders and one sergeant. Um, so the first thing I did is I believe uh, we need servant leaders in the organization. And I thought that identifying servant leaders uh, was gonna be uh, the, best, uh, the, best, the best first step for me to uh, turn things around. Uh, so in order to do that, I worked with uh, some other chiefs in the area um, that have kind of been uh, leadership mentors to me, and we designed a commander's promotional exam uh, that was based on servant leadership. Uh, this was a little bit of a change from the past. Uh, I believe our, our promotional exams in the past have been kind of checked the box, if you will. They tested for a little bit of leadership, technical competency, and whatnot. But I felt like I really needed an exam that was going to identify the type of leader I needed to promote. Um, so we went and designed that type of test. Then I added a new process to it, a 360 uh, roundtable evaluation. Um, I think that when you promote a leader, um, a lot of times the, the command staff and the leadership that's making that decision, it, we're really only evaluating those folks as followers and not their potential as a leader. So I incorporated the line level employees into that decision-making process 
so that I could uh, completely evaluate our candidates as both leaders and followers. Um, the next thing I did once I assembled uh, command staff uh, was establish the leadership expectations. Um, I felt like uh, it was important to have uh, expectations for the entire leadership team and to incorporate accountability into those expectations. Um, after that, um, a few things that we had worked on uh, or were a common trend uh, within the department as I was growing up here was uh, we said no unless we had to say yes. And I feel like if you want buy-in from your employees and you truly want to change a culture, um, our employees are our biggest asset. And we should uh, foster their growth and their ideas by saying yes, unless we have to say no. So that became part of the new culture. Somebody brings up an idea forward, let's find a way to say yes instead of saying no. Uh, another change that I implemented right away was we've always had a, a answer to common things as um, why, uh, well, well, we've always done it that way. Well, that was no longer acceptable to me. I believe that government uh, has been reactive to things uh, in the past, and it is time for us to make more of a transition from a management style to a leadership style. And we need to be proactive and um, look forward to the change that is coming or the challenges that we're going to uh, deal with. And in order to do that, uh, we need to get away from the way that we've always done things and uh, operate more like corporate America and find ways to be more efficient in what we're doing and find ways to uh, do more with the resources that we have um, and make more efficient use of our time. And then the next uh, change that I made that was huge was uh, I've always heard, uh, what is the rest of the Valley doing before we would make a change? And I immediately put an end to that and said, you know, well, while the rest of the Valley agencies are, are fantastic police departments and do a lot of great things, I wasn't really concerned with what they were doing though. I wanted them to say, what's Auburn doing? And so if we're gonna be a premier law enforcement agency, we need to set the standard and the expectation. So I quickly uh, started to uh, instill the idea that um, we're gonna worry about what Auburn's doing instead of everybody else. Um, and then we increased recognition, um, added one, three, and five-year goals for employees, and started a robust uh, mentoring program. As a result of that, I believe that started the leadership uh, shift and change in the agency um, that has taken us to new directions. And I know later on, we're going to talk about uh, the results of that and the follow-up to that. Um, aside from that, another idea that I thought about was you know, it's our job as police officers to serve our community, but how do we really know what our community wants from us? I always used vehicle pursuits as an example. Um, vehicle pursuits are inherently dangerous at times, um, but they're also necessary to hold those accountable um, who victimize our community. But I don't really know if our community wants us to chase cars or not. Uh, and so I know other agencies had advisory committees or chief advisory committees or whatnot. So I always wanted to create something like a police advisory committee. Well, after the death of George Floyd and, demand, and the demands for police reform, uh, that quickly got accelerated. And as I had this idea, ironically enough, uh, Commander Adams was meeting with uh, Pastor Lambert and Pastor Lambert had just walked out of Commander Adams' office and I walked down to talk to him about it, and that is where the police advisory committee uh, came together, and we started putting those ideas into motion and moving forward. And I think, Mayor, this would be a good time for me to transition back to you so that we can allow Pastor Lambert to talk about the PAC. Excellent. Well, and thank you, Chief, for, for sharing. There's even more that that you didn't talk about that you were able to do. And I, I'm sure you'll come up with some of it later on. Uh, I was just so impressed with your, with your dedication and your diligence. And I reminded you early on that I needed you to, to pace yourself because I didn't want you to, to burn out because uh, you were going at such uh, 
an accelerated pace to, to try and write some of the things in the department for morale and with community. And, and I appreciate your dedication to, to our community. Uh, so Pastor Lambert, you, uh, first of all, uh, I know that you answered it for those on Facebook Live, but there was a question about what, uh, what church you belong to and how you're connected to the city. And then if you wouldn't mind starting with that, and then since you are the co-chair of the, of the PAC, the Police Advisory Committee that Chief O'Neill just spoke about, if you could, could talk about that a little bit, what do you see as the greatest benefits to our community for the PAC? I was at that very first meeting okay. and listening to everyone's reasonings for wanting to be involved. So if you can just share some of your experiences, how can the community be more involved? And again, what do you see as the greatest benefits? Well, in answering, uh, again, thank you so much for having me be a part of this because most discussions dealing with social justice or police reform are a group of police officers talking to a bunch of people who support the police department or it's a bunch of people of color supported by people of color and there's very little uh, actual interaction and discussion. So I, I see a great value in this town hall and I appreciate my brothers and sisters out there in Auburn that are chiming in asking for more real content and less fluff. But we, uh, Resurrection Church Auburn is the church I pastor. It's right downtown Auburn at 123 L Street. Uh, and after George Floyd, uh, something had to be done. Uh, our congregation is a, a truly multiracial diverse group of people that get together and that's on purpose. Because again, not demanding that you adhere to my, my faith systems but I am saying that I believe heaven will be a diverse place and we should practice down here. If we're worshiping on Sunday and everybody's white or everybody's black or everybody is hetero or everyone is however you would choose to identify yourself, we've missed the point. And most discussions dealing with policing and law enforcement have been everyone siloed talking to themselves, surrounded by people that look like, think like, act like, and live as they do. Uh, when the protests started, I knew that our city uh, was, in a, was in a place of peril because there's a lot of frustration that's been built up since long before I was born. Uh, I see someone on Facebook Live asking about uh, Native and Muckleshoot representation. Yes, I believe there are three uh, Muckleshoot tribal members that are, are, uh, that are on the police advisory committee. But I went to talk to our mayor and chief of police and we sat down and had a conversation. I think that when a couple hours with, with us and several members of the city council and some other administrators to make sure that we all had clarity. We didn't want to just take a, a picture saying that we are the world. Uh, we've been ringing that bell far too long. It's time to do something and do something substantive instead of playing games when it's our children's lives at stake. I'm raising four African-American young men who all did well in school but I did not feel that there was the, the presentation of justice and equality in our city and definitely not in our nation. And after taking a couple of days to literally sit on the end of my bed and cry because I did not know what else to do, I contacted our, our mayor who contacted our chief and said, let's get together and talk, but not just talking for talking's sake, but talking to see what we could do. And that led to that meeting that Chief O'Neill alluded to with Commander Adams, where we had to do something where people had voice. After talking to uh, Mama Curley and several other Muckleshoot members, the issue was not a, a black policing issue. It was not a native policing issue. It was not just a uh, Pacific Islander or Asian policing issue. It was safety in Auburn. So we had to give people a tool or a mechanism to make their voices heard a, a theme that's going to pop up several times tonight for me is taxation without representation. Now, I have a great relationship with our chief, but that required uh, a, quite a bit of effort. There wasn't a tool. There wasn't a mechanism. When uh, Commander Adams and I first talked, you could not, you couldn't file a complaint with our police department. 
it was not available. We kept clicking the button that should have taken you there and it took you right back to the front page, which meant if you were a citizen who did not like the way that you were being treated as a tax, tax paying law abiding citizen, you had no recourse other than being frustrated, which we saw in cities all around us when push came to shove and the oppression was more than we could bear, things started being set on fire. When we talked, I remember stating that I will do everything I can to make sure that our city does not burn, but we have to sit down and have these conversations and there has to be change. A lot of the change is education and others were, uh, my original stance was I wanna make sure that every officer makes it home at the end of their shift but also wanna make sure that every citizen feels comfortable that they're gonna make it home safe after a traffic stop or an encounter with law enforcement. I am unapologetically pro-life and that doesn't, that's not an abortion talk. I just support life, whether you are eight weeks old or 80 years old, whether you're black or you're white or you're native, that we must protect life. Chief O'Neill, Commander Adams, our mayor, seem to share that point, stepping away from politics and giving people access. Someone asked who's on the police advisory committee. Every demographic that we could think of, and after talking to people in the legal department and attorneys and other people around the city, we've gone after every group. And if there's something that we're missing, the way the group is formed, if there's a group that is not represented, we just add another member so that everyone has a stake in the progress in Auburn. Our greatest asset is that our chief in every presentation that I have seen is up for change and education. It is not him sitting there and what I'll call police explaining away the, the hurt of generations of abuses. It is a team of people sitting there saying, what can we do to make everyone feel safe? I don't want Commander Betts worried if he has to pull someone over about what's gonna happen, but also don't want my sons or anyone else's children feeling afraid when they have a confrontation with law enforcement. I don't want our business owners afraid of theft without there being prosecution on the back end. So the police advisory committee has gone out of its way to make recommendations and consistent input, not just to ourselves, but to the city council, to the mayor, and to the chief of police to give everyone access so that instead of, because Martin Luther King said that protest and riot is the voice of the oppressed. Our objective is to reduce the oppression by giving everyone voice, not dismissively. Those days are over. We're, we're not gonna play patty cake. We're not, we're not gonna just pass around some cookies and say we're, we're buddies. But substantive change. Since the police advisory committee has started, there has been consistent pursuit of le less lethal apprehension tools whether it be the bola wrap or other tools so that we don't, in Auburn, I can't speak for everywhere else, but I believe it's gonna spread. In Auburn, we're doing everything we can to preserve life and give people access to justice. So uh, the greatest tool, uh, Madam Mayor, is that there's many ideas that are out there that have been trapped in the back room of the VFW or up on the reservation or up on Lee Hill or Lakeland Hills or over in South Auburn but now we have a tool to get those ideas, those suggestions, those perspectives to the people who have the ability to change them and also to allow for accountability because once the problem has been noted, once people have been presented with the truth, if they choose not to change, I believe there'll be an inspiration to get people to come out and vote to get rid of the people that do not support a safer Auburn. And so I'm a huge supporter of our law enforcement the police advisory committee, and all of those who don't like me, I support you and your voice because we want you heard in your city. It's not my city, it's not the mayor's city, it's our city, it's our community. And together, I believe that we can have unity, peace, and justice. And again, I thank you for letting me be a part of this. Thank you, Pastor Lambert. And Commander Adams, you are the other co-chair of the PAC. So could you share why you wanted to be involved and what you see as the benefits for the community? And then how have PAC members, because I, I think there are questions on Facebook about this, but how have PAC members engaged with the rest of our community and is there more to come? 
Uh, definitely more to come with the uh, PAC members in the community thing. Now that we have our awesome PIO on board, we're going to do some things to make the PAC members more accessible. Um, you know, I wanted to be part of the PAC because when Pastor Lambert came to me, um, we just had our protest out here. Um, I went out in front of everybody and uh, took a knee with the protesters. And, you know, after that, we spent a lot of time talking. Everyone that wanted to have a conversation, I, I made myself available as did other officers. And we had great conversations with people of our community. We got a lot of questions answered and we got a lot of questions unanswered that we needed to work on. And so I met with Pastor Lambert. It was a great opportunity for us to start something new. And that's where the PAC was born. And like Chief O'Neill said, uh, I walk out of the office with, um, after our meeting with Pastor Lambert and he, Chief and I are both smiling, talking about let's do something to get the community involved. And so from there was the PAC. Um, I felt that it's my responsibility and duty. I signed up to be a police officer and police the city and serve the city. And so one way I could do that is by the police advisory committee where we wanted advice from the people. I mean, do we get everyone's voice? No, of course not. But we are trying to get as many voices as possible and we're willing to have a conversation with anyone. Great. And Commander Adams, can you talk a little bit about the the diversity of membership. Um, Pastor Lambert touched on it and the fact that if there is a group that is not represented, we are, we are open to bringing others into the pack. But can you talk a little bit about when you and, and Pastor Lambert and Chief O'Neill were, were talking about the pack and we, we spoke about it as well, what what were the goals? What type of of diversity uh, is is on the pack? The the membership. How did how did that come about? And I know there's at least fifteen. Oh yeah. Uh, so we looked at everyone, uh, everyone's application, and we wanted people that hit multiple boxes. We didn't just want someone that touched one. We wanted someone that hit the seniors, and also maybe was a business owner, and also was a black male or black female or LGBTQ. We wanted people that had a hand in other things because our city is diverse and we wanted diverse people on this board. Um, you know, we have mixed race people, we have non mixed race people, but we wanted people that reached out across every category that we could touch on. And so we sat down and looked at every application and, you know, we looked at people that checked three or four or five boxes. Uh, for our one district, for example, that gentleman is a, he's a black male who also lives in the city, who also works in the city. And th that's just three boxes right there that he checks, which makes it, you know, more diverse because he has a vested interest in multiple levels, not only where he lives, but where he works. And, you know, and as a black male in the city. So, I mean, we went over applications. We weren't looking for people that were thinking the police are the greatest because they won't give us the advice that we need and want. We wanted people that are like, I eh, kind of like you, but I don't like like you. And so <laughs> I think that helped us a lot with our group of people. And uh, at our meetings, you know, uh, they provide great feedback mm -hmm. and give us great questions. And so I really enjoy the pack and I hope it continues to expand into something that lasts long term. Great. And Chief, I know um, maybe you can touch a little bit more on, uh, I, I think, I said there are at least 15 positions. I think there are at least 24 uh, going back through that. But I know all six of the different police districts are represented uh, as Commander Adams said, business community members, fire, uh, veterans, law enforcement, someone from Green River, I believe, as well as the Auburn School District. How, uh, what other groups, what am I missing? Uh, I know Muckleshoot is represented and as Commander Adams said, checking more than one box, that's that intersectionality, right? Where, where we, are, uh, we are not just uh, identified by one characteristic or our ethnicity, but we, we are multifaceted and we, we want that. And I'm, I'm glad he mentioned that we didn't want everyone that was just pro-police. That's, that's not going to provide what we were looking for. So I don't know if you have anything else that you would like to add to that, Chief. Yeah, I think uh, you hit all, the, hit all the spots on the head. I know uh, 
uh, we tried to include everybody. And even after we pushed out the applications, um, we added a few more positions that we uh, inadvertently uh, overlooked. I know one that came to mind was uh, we added a group for to represent somebody with disabilities uh, in the city. And then um, Pastor Lambert and uh, Commander Adams and I, we, we sat down and we looked through all those uh, applications and um, we, we looked to find the right mix of individuals. We didn't want, uh, just like Commander Adams said, we weren't looking for people that uh, were pro-police and pro-Auburn police supporters because we weren't gonna get anywhere and we weren't gonna have the difficult conversations that uh, needed to be had if everybody coming into this group was uh, already supportive of the police department. So we tried to find that right mix and we also tried to uh, find people that uh, filled uh, multiple categories uh, because we believe that was gonna increase the diversity of the group. Right. And Commander Adams, uh, getting back to you, this isn't necessarily PAC related, but it is community engagement related. Just a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of watching some of the members of the Auburn Police Department in a basketball game against the Auburn Adventist Academy team. Tell us, tell us why it was important to you to be involved in that. And then what are the plans for the future? Uh, it, it was very important, you know, give back to the community and uh, build relationships with the uh, young men and women uh, that were in the game. You know, we made a lot of friends. We made a lot of contacts. I mean, uh, you know, Auburn won that night. I won't say which Auburn, but uh, Auburn won. <laughs> I think and, there's some photos that may have the scores <laughs> in them if we look closely. <laughs> I think those are photoshopped. But, uh, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, they raised a lot of money. We got to hang out with these uh, young men and women and uh, have conversations and, you know, in between plays and just talk to them. And a lot of the kids I got to know and, and hear about their plans for the future. And, you know, we got to we're not in uniform. We're just running around playing basketball and having a good time. And so the plan for the future is that Hopefully, uh, now that COVID restrictions are being um, lifted and things like that, that hopefully we, uh, we can work to other high schools and play games uh, against the graduating seniors before they're you know, on the way out. Um, if we don't get beat too bad and we're healthy enough to keep on playing, we'll do it as long as we can. Uh, hopefully, that could transition into a softball game against the uh, baseball team and, and fast pitch team. And just things to show people, one, we're trying to do some things with these kids and and build relationships and uh, hopefully, you know, do some fundraising for the schools. Well, and, and the fact that there are human beings behind the badge, I, I don't want us to ever lose sight of that. Um, two things that I noticed that night, or one that I was thankful for that there were no injuries. So we didn't have anybody out on injury the next day or even that night as they went on shift, but there was a lot of trash talking going on on that court. Uh, it was it was kind of fun to listen to, but it was it was just really a true sense of sportsmanship and just having fun and for forgetting about differences and just just enjoying time out on the court. Uh, so I I was really proud to to be there and and watch that interaction. Again, thankful that Noble was injured. Uh, the score was not reflective of the heart that went into the game. I will just say that. <laughs> there were no injuries, only hurt feelings. And that was, uh, yeah, but it was a great time. It really it, was a great time. And I, I'm just honored that, that uh, the school opened the doors to us and those kids were willing to uh, beat us like they did. I mean, yeah, they're play good. With us like they did. Yeah, yeah, they were good. Again, they, were, they were very, very good. Auburn won, exactly. Uh, all of Auburn won that evening. <laughs> so, um, Colby, you uh, being the newest member of, of the APD family, uh, first of all, welcome. We are very excited that you're here. And as Commander Adams mentioned, engagement and positive community interactions, I think that's one of the main areas of focus for you. So can you share with us what your plans are for engagement with the community as a whole, and then specifically with the BIPOC community? You know, community engagement is obviously a very big deal, and that's kind of what my goal is. I want to get Auburn PD completely immersed into uh, the Auburn community. And in the few weeks that I've been here, I feel like I've done a pretty good job at that so far, but that's only the start of it. Now, 
Uh, if you've been following our social media sites, you've seen that we have been getting officers out to things, get places like summer camps, getting them involved with children. And then as things start to open back up post COVID here, uh, I would like to start getting them involved with more community activities as well. Getting our officers out into the community, dealing with people on a daily basis, outside of police work, getting them involved uh, in many different ways is the one way we can build that bridge between Auburn PD and the community. And I feel that is extremely important to do. Now, some of the things that we are working on, some ideas that we've come forward uh, that we're gonna be posting out to our social media channel soon. Now we've started a weekly reading with Archie and Chance. Those are two mascots that Chief O'Neill brought in. They're awesome canines. They're a lot of fun for the children because we wanna not just build relationships with the adults here in the Auburn community, but we wanna build relationships with children as well. I went out to, um, I went out with some officers to a local school a couple weeks ago and some of the kids had poor reactions to the officers that arrived that were there hanging out with the kids, showing them the patrol car and things like that. And those are the kind of interactions that, you know, we want to try to eliminate. We want children to see the police officers and be able to go to them if they need help. So by building these relationships with the children, by doing uh, Archie and Chance, the mascots, doing the children books, getting the officers to the summer camps. Today, they went and played Ultimate Frisbee. That was one of our posts today. That was a lot of fun for the officers involved with that and the kids as well. Now, another thing we wanna do is bring back talk with a cop. Uh, obviously, COVID put a damper on this with a human interaction, but talk with a cop is very important. Again, getting, people, getting officers out into the community and talking face-to-face -face with people and just getting to know individuals in our community uh, what better way than to do that out in person? And then obviously getting involved with the PACs, getting involved more with the PACs message. I'll be going to the PAC meetings as well, and I'll be pushing out brief summaries of what's being talked about so that people who aren't attending or going or knowing, uh, they can go to our social media pages and they will be able to uh, basically tune in and understand what is happening at these meetings. I also want to start doing little features with each member of the PAC. Uh, get to know each PAC member, see why they join and what they're doing and what they're trying to change as a member of the PAC. Some of the things we want to get involved, uh, start doing live PD going out. I'm, I'll start going out on ride alongs and I'll live tweet what it's like to be a, a day in the life of an officer so that people can see uh, who, who these people are on a regular basis. So as their day progresses, we'll, we will go in. I'll be with them, whether it's the graveyard shift or the day shift and we'll push out um, what they're doing. What, what does their day look like? Uh, it'd be a great inside look for, for the people of Auburn. Also with these new police reform laws, we'll be creating a series of videos. So we'll be pushing those out pretty soon here, explaining the new laws and what will be changing with that. We also wanna start doing monthly questions to the chief. We'll push out a social media post asking you to send in questions that the chief will specifically answer on Facebook Live. So we'll give you about a week notice for that. And uh, we'll take your questions and then we'll have, you can address the chief specifically. And if you have a question just for him, he will be able to answer it. So we have a lot of ideas. We have more ideas that we're working on, but I think what's important is everyone that's watching here tonight. If you have ideas, let us know. We're going to be putting out contact information here soon. Um, uh, ways for you to contact me. Uh, one of them is our, my email, which is policepio at auburn.gov send us, send me ideas. I would love to have ideas. If you have pictures or any sort of interaction whatsoever with our officers, let me know because I would love to share those stories and messages. Another thing is social media. We're really big on social media. Uh, if you've noticed, our social media has really picked up in the last couple of weeks. I'm reading all those comments. Um, you can also reach out through messaging, things like that on those social media platforms. And that's another way you can contact me with uh, those awesome ideas. Oh, that answers the question. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Colby. Uh, I, I just want some of the members who are asking questions on, on Facebook to know that, that we do see your questions and we are going to, uh, in fact, we, I had some questions to ask to each one of our panelists and some of the questions that you are asking are directly related to the questions that I will be asking. So I don't want you to think that we're ignoring you and we are going to try and get to absolutely as many questions as we possibly can. So hopefully you will find the answers to your questions in, in these upcoming questions. Um, in fact, I'm going to move to command, uh, 
commander, you were a commander at one point, Assistant Chief Callier. Mark, what is your main role in the department? Uh, so my main role um, is basically overseeing the daily operations uh, so the chief is free to do other things. Um, so I oversee the budget for the department. You know, one of those glorious things that when you get into law enforcement, you don't ever think of, but you end up having to do one day. Um, I make sure that the vision of the chief is carried out within all the divisions. Uh, I oversee um, all the discipline in the department uh, for officers that may have a misstep in their career. Um, I am the uh, for lack of a better term, kind of the liaison for our community court that started up in Auburn. Um, and I think the important thing, when people think of community court, they don't think that uh, the police are really involved other than maybe providing security, but it's really beneficial to our department um, to help reduce the recidivism of, of us going out and making the same contacts with the same individuals who are committing the same crimes over and over again in Auburn. The hope is if community court works and those individuals qualify, they go through the program, they get connected to resources through the program, and it stops that cycle of just going out, committing crimes, getting arrested, going to jail, and never receiving any help. And so that's our hope from the police department side on how that benefits us and our officers, just kind of um, so we can focus on other things instead of those constant um, kind of misdemeanor crimes that some of these individuals don't, I guess, for lack of better terminology, don't have a way to get out of that cycle. Mm -hmm. um, Community court can be a really good off ramp for, for someone who has found themselves in the criminal justice system, I think is probably uh, an accurate statement. Would you agree? I would agree. I, I think that's our biggest hope for community court is that it, it works as it's intended to and connects those people um, that are willing, uh, again, to um, get in touch with the resources because everything is right there at the resource center and available to them. And you know you can't force somebody to do it, but you hope they make that choice to get out of that cycle. Right. And uh, Mark, one of, one of the things that I uh, was proud of that Chief brought forward to us was that the Auburn Police Department was selected as one of only a few agencies in the country to uh, be uh, invited to the Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement Program, or ABLE. Can you talk a little bit about what that program is? And then some of the questions uh, on Facebook Live are talking about police accountability. And so I think talking about ABLE and then transitioning into some of that police accountability, I think would, would be a great, great opportunity if you could do that. Yeah, so ABLE is a program that's put on by uh, Georgetown University. It's based on a program from uh, New Orleans uh, Police Department. And you know, with the title Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement, you know, what does that mean? It helps officers recognize when other officers um, may be going, something may be going on with them that could lead them to get into trouble within the department. Um, whether it's recognizing signs that maybe there's trouble at home, uh, things like that. So they can feel comfortable intervening with that officer prior to something happening. And then it also translates to when they're out working on the street. Um, if they see an officer who uh, maybe getting upset because officers are human and uh, everybody, you know, has certain but buttons that will get them upset. It's so those officers feel comfortable that maybe they can step in, move that officer out of the situation, get it calm, get it under control. So it doesn't rise to something that maybe involves a use of force or, or things that lead, um, you know, to an officer losing a career because he got upset and made, he or she got upset, made a bad choice at that time. So it gives it, it's just extra tools to help those officers recognize signs and then gives them some uh, ability to how to deal with it. Great. And um, so there was also a question on there because you mentioned that you oversaw the, um, uh, the, um, 
disciplinary actions. And they're concerned that disciplinary actions are on the shoulders of one person. And can you talk about that a little bit? Because I know that's not the case. So maybe just maybe walk us through a disciplinary action, if you will. Sure. So we have a pretty robust uh, complaint policy on how to handle investigations. And so, you know, there's things that maybe a sergeant can, you know, like a, a low level thing uh, that a complaint would come in about discourtesy, that an officer was discourteous. Well, that's something that a sergeant can address at the time it happens and kind of figure out what's going on. Um, when I say that I oversee, basically my position, um, all these complaints funnel through our chain of command. They'll go from whether they're initiated internally or externally. They, they go through our chain of command. Uh, they'll come to me. They'll get us. Um, if there's a determination that it fits our policy, whether it could be a, an inquiry, an internal investigation, things like that, um, or that there's a problem coming up, they'll be forwarded to the chiefs with my recommendation, hey, we need to look further into this because of whatever the circumstance may be. And so they're assigned out at that point to our internal investigations division for investigation. Um, officers are just like anybody within their job, they're guaranteed due process um, throughout the course of the investigation. But when it comes to the point that um, the investigation is concluded, it goes to a, a review board. And based on the seriousness of maybe what the allegation is, if it could lead to uh, discipline that involves some type of uh, property right loss, which is uh, suspension from duty, you know, loss of vacation time, uh, up to including termination, that our policy dictates who chairs those supervisory review boards. And so then the review board will determine based on the facts that are presented, whether or not there is a violation. And then depending on the seriousness, um, I would hold a hearing with the officer and then make a recommendation of what the discipline level would be at that point. And so my recommendations are reviewed uh, by our HR department, by the city's um, insurance carrier to make sure that have I followed all uh, processes necessary for this discipline to be upheld, you know, especially if it's serious discipline to make sure that, that everything is done correctly before it's uh, handled, um, before it's issued to the officer. And so the reason it stops at my level is there's some contractual obligations where the first appeal process is directly to the chief. And so um, he has, he obviously will keep him informed of what my intentions would be as far as any discipline. Um, you know, in it, any discipline handed out would be vetted quite thoroughly at that point that it's, you know, basically could be upheld during any appeal. And so, um, that's kind of how our process works. So it's not really, um, I don't decide everything. I don't do the investigations usually. Um, I can ask more questions if there's some clarification that's needed, but, but a review board ultimately makes the decision. And then based on whatever factors are involved, then I'll make the decision on uh, the actual discipline. Okay, thank you. And then that appeal process can go up to the chief and then to me and then to mediation if, if the officer chooses to do so, right? Yes. Okay. So, um, Pastor, it looks like you're wanting to add something to this conversation. And then I want to ask Commander Adams about use of force. There are some questions on use of force. So, uh, Commander Adams, if you could get ready for that, Pastor Lambert, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here. And as uh, the mayor knows, I'm watching the comments on Facebook and I get it because the, what's being explained right now, we took a few months to walk through the process of what happens when something bad happens, but what you're not hearing is that it's being put to work. And I'm having a chance to see, and I'm, I'm believing, because we asked that our new uh, public information officer not just do a great job of being, uh, well, a public relations person for the police department, but to let you know what's going on. When we have problems that are being fixed, uh, the chief, he's not doing a good job of tooting his own horn. I think he's a great law officer, but the, the truth is he's making hard decisions that don't always keep him in good graces with those in the community that would say everything that the law enforcement does is right, so don't question it. He's really going through and reviewing, and we're seeing progress. 
Now, I, I know it's not moving as fast as I would like, but there are all these structures that have to be taken care of. That's not an excuse. It's just the work that's being done. Now, a lot of it, because of legal, legal ease, becomes really boring. It's like, well, I need a head. Somebody needs to pay for it, and they need to pay for it now. And I believe that if we as a community will step up and say, here's what we demand, then the next time that union contracts are talked about or attorneys are brought in, it will not be us sitting back and doing the same thing that we've always done. I, I appreciate the efforts that are being made, but we, we have to get after it and stay on it. Like I, I see the comments and I love them, this is, this is great. But we now have tools to make sure that they get the information. And if you don't feel that's working, uh, I think all y'all can see my stuff on Facebook. Send it to me directly. I'll walk it into the offices. I know they want to hear it. And if the mechanisms are broken, we, we can't stop. We can't just say the mechanism is broken and be upset. We have to fix it. And if the people that are in charge of fixing it won't do it, let's hold them accountable. And for me as a citizen here, I have to be accountable for walking down to the police station or for walking to City Hall and making that meeting happen. And so far, I haven't been turned away. And if you have, let us know so we can make sure that whoever turns you away is dealt with. I have confidence in this process. Now, it has been challenging. It has been frustrating. I've been up many nights going, why didn't they just fix it? Now, some things I'm finding that some of my brothers and sisters whose eyes are a different color than mine don't understand the urgency with some of these issues. But over time and relationship, I believe that people who I used to say were on the opposite side of an issue can acknowledge that we have to change. Chief O'Neill, our mayor and others have said, the old way of doing things didn't work. We have to do something new. So in this town hall, give ideas, give support, give suggestion, give jeers, give criticism as to what's not working. Instead of saying it's not working, let's talk specifically about what's not working for you, your community, your family, so that you're invested in the process because we didn't get here in one year. So it might take more than one year to fix it. And so far I've seen a lot of change in how things are handled and even the terminology that we're using that is much less inflammatory and it's not just politically correctness, I believe it's a mindset shift. Now, I get that, uh, the chief isn't running for office, so I'm not trying to get you to vote for him, but I'm asking you to give him the, the tools necessary to change the things that he can't possibly see from City Hall or from the police station. Let's, let's hold them accountable to what they're telling us that the real change is gonna happen because that's what I'm hearing. Real change is gonna happen and I wanna be a part of the process. And if you don't give us the information through the police advisory committee or whatever tool you want so that we can make sure we're moving forward. If you feel your demographic is being left out, let us know so that we can have those difficult conversations and not say, come to us, we'll come to you. Just let us know that there's a problem because I'm seeing change, but I'm spending a lot of time in meetings that not everybody's a part of. And I believe that uh, Mr. Colby Crosley will do a, a great job of getting that information out. And if not, ho hold us accountable. Call Absolutely. the jury. We have to get Call me. Done. Call me. Um, Commander Adams, there have been some questions about use of force. Can you, can you tell us about how use of force data is collected, what, what the requirements are for reporting use of force? And then I believe there's a use of force committee as well. And, and then um, there's also some new legislation required for use of force reporting that's going into effect, I believe later this month. But, but can you share how, how Auburn has been dealing with use of force? Um, I know there was a question at one point about how do we collect the data? Is it broken out by ethnicity? And at this time, I don't believe it is, but that's one of the things that we're going to take into consideration for moving forward. But can you just talk about use of force in general and, and the protocols? Yes, uh, and it actually is uh, broken down by race. Page 10, table 14 depicts uh, the demographics. I saw Great. that question come up a couple of times. It, uh, there's two tables. One on demographics, another one on gender. So it is tracked and it always has been. Um, but long story short, when an officer uses force, they have to contact their supervisor who comes out to the scene and makes their own observations. They interview, they ask the officer questions. 
they uh, interview any witnesses, and then they interview the suspect, the person that force was used on. That uh, supervisor completes a separate document other than the officer's use of force, and it is attached with the officer's use of force. Uh, and this is based off their own observations. Every use of force is then sent to a patrol commander. We review it, and then we uh, send it to our assistant chief of police, who then distributes it to the use of force committee, which is a five officer panel made up of two commanders and three sergeants. All five of those members have uh, four science certificates. So they have been through additional training above and beyond what the normal officer goes to when it comes to investigating uses of force. Uh, of those five members, three of us, myself included, are defensive tactics instructors. And uh, one is a firearms instructor and the uh, other is a, the SWAT commander, but also has four science uh, certificates. Uh, Every use of force that comes in is reviewed by all five members of the panel. If there's anything um, that does not that does not look right, then it goes uh, back to the assistant chief to review and assign for an internal investigation if necessary. Uh, and then, then again, for every use of force that is done, uh, myself or one of the other uh, sergeants mentioned, we complete a separate document uh, documenting the date, the time, the officers there, uh, all the things relevant to the use of force, uh, including mental health, if arrest advisements were given, if command and consequences were given. And then at the end of the month, at the beginning of the next month, we get together, all five of us, and we review every single use of force, looking for trends with the officers and the calls we're going to and seeing when force is being used. We are going to use that data because it's the first year we've done it, and we are going to tailor our training around that. So. Uh, like so far with our training, we have been noticing things uh, that officers are communicating better. And so we're going to continue to push on that in our training to make sure officers are communicating, that they are using the minimum amount of force necessary to affect the lawful arrest. And we are going to continue to push that direction. We want our officers to be well-trained. We want them to be calm under pressure. And we want them to use the minimal amount of force necessary to affect the lawful arrest. Are we perfect? No. Do we want to be? Heck yeah. And so we're going to keep working on it and keep looking at the data and continue to train and retrain and train some more to make sure we serve this community the best way possible. Thank you. And Mark, there were some questions about body cameras. Uh, I know that we have a few body cameras in the department right now, uh, and there will be more discussion on that at our Monday evening, July 12th study session with city council. But do you wanna talk about body cams a, a little bit? Uh, and then I think Chief O'Neill, you may have some statistics and things. And then there's also questions about PTSD with officers and mental health for those in the community as well as mental health for our officers. So let's, let's work through body cameras and then we'll go to uh, some statistics as well as mental health, if that's all right. Sure. So we've actually had um, cameras in our patrol cars for a, a number of years. Uh, we've recently supplemented um, some of the units that don't uh, typically use a patrol car day and out, um, like our motorcycle unit, um, our bicycle officers uh, with body cams. Um, in the past, there's been uh, funding issues um, surrounding those because they can be very expensive. Um, but we do at least have um, the in-car vehicles for every marked unit you see out there. They have a, uh, a camera in the car with a, a transmitter that's recording at the time. So we do have a proposal ready to go for council on Monday for outfitting um, all of our officers with body cameras. Um, you know, hopefully they will agree with uh, the proposal we have. Um, I'm going to push that out there now. Uh, but, you know, some of the, the legislative changes you'll see, um, there's some mandates as far as uh, when we are out interviewing people now, those interviews have to be recorded. So we have to find a way to act, to do those to make sure that they were staying within the law and that anything learned um, will be uh, admissible if necessary in, into whatever court proceeding uh, may come out of that. And so our push and our, our goal is to outfit every officer with body cameras. Um, there, is, there is an expense tied to that. And you know, we're, 
a presentation Monday is to, to counsel uh, about all the pros and cons of kind of that, uh, of getting those outfitted. Um, as far as how we use them, um, you know, we, we made it known to officers, it's in our policy that even with the limited limitations on the cameras and the patrol cars, that if they're in contact with somebody, they should have those activated. So we're at least recording uh, voice as much as possible with those within the limitations of range and things like that. And so we do periodically review those to make sure because there's certain requirements um, from our courts as far as advising people they're being recorded. Um, it's in our policy. So we're, we periodically review those. When we do get complaints in, um, that's usually the first thing we check to see if that interaction was recorded. Um, several times in the past where we've gotten certain complaints, we've been able to watch the video. Um, we're able to, you know, the, determine that, well, what they presented maybe not was valid. And so we've actually invited people in to view the body camera or the, uh, the camera footage to, to kind of let them explain what maybe their perception was at the time compared to what the video is showing us and maybe what the officer actually said. So it's, they can be beneficial to both parties. Um, and, you know, they can be used to hold officers accountable because like <laughs> Commander Adam said, uh, we are human and, and we do make mistakes out in the field that we want to correct as soon as possible. Right. I, I think that's a critical piece that body cameras are for the benefit of everyone in the community. They're for the benefit of the officers in numerous ways, and they are beneficial for our community in numerous ways. And so uh, I look forward to helping support council in their deliberations on an expenditure for body cameras and the additional uh, full-time employees that are going to go along with implementing body cameras. But that conversation, and I will, I will uh, plug it again at the end of this town hall and uh, let you know how you can listen in on some of the legislative changes as well as the request for body cameras and, and other, uh, other tools for our officers to be using. Uh, Chief, can we, can we talk a little bit about mental health challenges both for our community and for our officers and how do we deal with that? Yeah, so that's a great question and that's a, uh, a topic that is very important for first responders um, and I am uh, very grateful that we are increasing our wellness of that. Um, you know, for the longest time, uh, it seemed like we really focused on staying uh, fit as first responders, you know, uh, physically, uh, and we neglected our minds. Um, but just like everything else, you need to keep your mind sharp and keep your mind healthy. And there's been an increased uh, awareness of that in recent years, and it's important. Um, and we've uh, uh, tried to adapt to that as best we could at the Auburn Police Department. And unfortunately, uh, in the last two years, we have lost uh, two officers who could no longer do the job as a result of PTSD. Um, there's a statistic out there. Uh, I'm not even going to try and quote it because I'm sure I'd be way off. Um, but there's a stat that if you've done the job uh, for X uh, amount of time, you probably have some form of PTSD. Um, so some things that we've been doing as an agency to increase officer wellness uh, is as Assistant Chief Callier mentioned earlier, ABLE is a form of uh, officer wellness. Uh, we pay attention to each other no, uh, and view uh, changes that are going on so that we can intervene. Uh, another thing we did uh, recently this past year is we had uh, some fitness uh, equipment available for officers, but we what we did is we moved uh, the SWAT van out of the SWAT bay, found a new place to house that command vehicle, and we have a uh, decent uh, workout facility now where officers can exercise. And exercising before or after your shift is a great way to deal with stress and uh, clear your mind. Um, we also have uh, an expansive peer support program with officers that go to training on how to be uh, peer support counselors. Um, and that uh, every time we have a critical incident, we remind our officers of the availability of those peer support members so that they can have those confidential conversations about what's going on. Um, and those peer support members are available 24 seven, uh, even outside of a critical uh, 
uh, incident. Anytime an officer wants to talk to somebody. Uh, we also have a chaplaincy program where our officers have access to chaplains from our community who volunteer to participate uh, in our officer wellness. Uh, the chaplains uh, are available to our community, but they're also available to our officers. Uh, we see them around the station. Sometimes they just come in and ride with officers uh, to be available just to have conversations and uh, talk through things. Um, some other things that we're looking at are uh, offering uh, voluntary uh, wellness checks uh, to our officers as well each year, but that's uh, a contractual uh, issue, if you will, and um, we're still trying to figure out how to work through that uh, with our unions and our guild. But uh, taking care of our mind as first responders is uh, just, um, just as important as taking care of ourselves uh, physically, uh, and we're doing everything we can to increase that awareness and uh, we're looking for new ideas, new training, new sessions. Um, and I guess I should add, we also recently, uh, just this year, did two hours of training for every officer about uh, resiliency and taking care of yourself. And I have a, a meeting later this month with a vendor who has created a app uh, for officers to have uh, immediate access to an app uh, for mental health uh, training or just to talk to somebody or... Uh, a, a form of uh, counseling. So it's something we're working on. It's important and, and it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, Pastor Lambert, I know you've, you've touched on some of this, but you lead a very diverse congregation. What are you hearing from members of your church? Uh, how can APD be how have they been responsive and how can they be more responsive? What else can be done? Well, I appreciate you asking that question because our church, we range in ages from just got here to uh, super duper senior citizens. And there's been a consistent concern with uh, the rise in crime in our city, regardless of race. Our, our church in the last uh, month has been broken into five or six times and each time the police ha have come when notified, and we appreciate them coming, but we have to educate our citizens more on that, that it's a process. It's not just the police. There's a criminal justice system that must be examined and applied to all people equally, which I, I just ask for equality. For many, many years in, in our fair city, uh, that was not the case and not the expectation of many people. They knew they would not receive justice, but now I'm believing to choose, we're pressing toward a new day. And we want to see that if people steal things, they will be dealt with. If people are cutting catalytic converters off, they'll be dealt with. If people have mental health concerns, there's a place to send them. So the issues that many of the issues that we're talking about today, they're much bigger than uh, even the desk of office, uh, officer or chief O'Neill. We must make sure that our law enforcement, because they are receiving diversity training. They are receiving the mental health training, but we need to make sure that our court systems back them so that we can all be safe. Uh, there are, I had a pastor around the corner from me, Pastor Cheryl Olson, when her building was broken into, uh, the comment that was made was, well, you need cameras. As a citizen, uh, the perception was, I have the police that I don't, I don't need cameras. But in our current climate, where people may or may not be prosecuted for what I would perceive as a felony, we need to do something different. And whether it is black, native, or otherwise, people are asking for justice and equal protection under the law. Not just when something bad happens, that we're accused of doing something bad, but that our homes are safe, that our houses are safe, that our neighborhoods, because it doesn't matter where you live in Auburn right now, you are being strongly impacted uh, by homelessness. And at times, the inability to help our brothers and sisters that are trapped in a dark spiral get the support and help that they need. Because there's either no place that will give them the mental health support they need or a way of keeping people who I would perceive as violent away from hurting other people. These are the things that I'm hearing over and over again. And like, I appreciate bringing out, out the puppies uh, and the mascots, but having men like uh, Officer Betts speak to people and let them know, here are the issues that I have with our city. Here are the injustices that I see have helped me a lot as a pastor, knowing that uh, this morning I called Commander Adams 
And I had to ask him a legal question. How can someone navigate this? But letting people know that they don't have to talk to me, they have access themselves. They don't need me as a representative. There are people in place to do this. But having the conversations being had, like we're talking about now and with the PAC, getting things out front, like for my congregation, concern number one is their personal safety. And so I'm encouraging them not just to tell the mayor and the chief of police, but to let um, the courts know, the prosecutors know, and the county commissioners know that we have a challenge down here and the people don't feel safe. And that is a universal. I, I haven't found a demographic that I represent or talk to outside of my church that's walking around saying, yes, I feel safe in my person and my property. And I, I choose to believe that if the people cry out enough, there will be change. Thank you, Pastor. Chief, can you respond to some of the comments or any or all of the comments that Pastor Lambert just provided? I think there are some powerful moments there. I think as uh, police officers, uh, you know, one of our top priorities and reason, the reason that uh, people get into this job is to help others uh, and to help our uh, community and to help our our everybody that's a part of our community. And I think um, that also includes uh, helping members of our community that are victimized. Um, and as law enforcement officers, uh, just like Pastor Lambert said, uh, there is a complete criminal justice system and we are only one part of it. Uh, in our courts, in our judges and prosecutor's office uh, is another part of it. And uh, especially over this past year, uh, law enforcement has re uh, remained essential during the pandemic, uh, but unfortunately our jails uh, went to restrictions on bookings and our courts went to uh, restrictions on how they were working and they were not operating at full capacity. And so while we still had law enforcement that was uh, essential and operating at a full capacity, uh, we didn't have jails where we could put people who were victimizing our community and we didn't have judges and prosecutors and juries inside of courthouses um, where we could prosecute those who had victimized uh, members of our community. And now there is a large backlog of cases um, of people that uh, have victimized members of our community. And uh, those cases need to be reviewed and filed and charged. And uh, there's a lack of resources uh, at the level of the courts to prosecute everybody that has uh, victimize somebody in our community. And so they are making decisions and prioritizing uh, cases um, and incidents. Um, and unfortunately, there's a large number of cases that are being dismissed just because there are the resources aren't available uh, in order to uh, hold those people accountable. Um, and so as law enforcement, we feel the the same frustration as Pastor Lambert and the members of his church. Um, and I think this is where we all need to uh, come together as a community and look for uh, those alternatives or figure out what are some creative ways that we can work together to improve uh, the safety of our community um, while the, the rest of the justice system uh, catches up and um, starts uh, ha handling things uh, the way our community expects it to. Uh, thank you, Chief. I, I just want to make a comment there. I, I know that often I will get emails or phone calls or uh, somehow people will talk to me at the grocery store, my, my second office, uh, and say, you know, police aren't doing their job. We ha I haven't seen a police officer in my neighborhood for a long time. Um, there's so much crime going on and our police just aren't doing their job. There are, and again, Monday night we'll be we'll be talking more about some of the legislative changes coming about that are going to make it even more challenging for our officers to do what I believe a majority of our community members expect of them. Um, so uh, don't really want to get into all of that right now, but there are challenges. Our, our officers come to work on a daily basis wanting to serve and protect our community. Now, there will be those on Facebook or on YouTube or somewhere who, who think that what I'm saying is a joke, but it is not a joke. I know our officers, 
are they perfect? As Commander Adams said, no, they are not perfect. We are all imperfect human beings, but we strive to be better every day. And it's because we get to hear from you and we interact with you and we try and be better. So I will, I will take any of the hits that you want to provide, but I can assure you that our officers led by Chief O'Neill, Assistant Chief Callier, every one of our commanders, everyone on their leadership teams, the goal is to have a police department that is here to serve this community. Now, you're not always going to agree with, with everything that our police officers do. There are interactions that are not going to be perfect. That's when we need to hear from you so that we can identify what needs to change. Uh, there are questions from the community on how can community members do more uh, by being proactive in making a difference in addition to sending suggestions. Are there things, uh, anyone, I, I would ask any of you to answer that question, other than provide um, suggestions, what else can members of our community do to be more supportive of police or to ensure the safety in our community? Anyone wanna answer that one? I will gladly answer. All right, thank you. So one thing we have, if you go to our city of Auburn uh, police webpage, we have a camera registry program where you can volunteer to register your surveillance cameras if you have any on your property. What that does is it lets officers know when they log in that you have a camera at your house. It is a voluntary program and does not provide us access to your cameras. It just lets us know that you have them. So for instance, if a crime happens in your neighborhood and the person flees on foot or in a vehicle, we can type in the address of the crime and look around at the map and see where there are cameras. That way we could contact you or email you or, or phone contact or in person and uh, ask you, hey, do you mind if you have time looking at your cameras from this time to this time? And that will help us track suspects um, you know, in, in their path to hopefully identify them. It'll also be a super helpful tool if a child uh, or an elderly person or someone goes missing. It'll be a great tool to help us to be able to canvas an area quickly and get that information. Now you might ask yourself, why don't you just go door to door and ask everybody? Very time consuming and not always uh, successful. So if we had the ability to get on a program, look at a map and see where there are cameras, we could reach out to people so much quicker than just walking around the neighborhood, hoping to see a camera on your house and then make contact with you that way. Thank you, Commander Adams. Chief O'Neill, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I want to uh, talk about a, a community award that the Police Advisory Committee is uh, creating. Uh, during one of our conversations, uh, we were talking about uh, the violence against our uh, Asian American population. And uh, as that conversation grew, um, the, the question came up, why do we as uh, community members not interject ourselves uh, when we see somebody that's uh, being treated poorly or unfairly? And uh, obviously the comments were, it's probably not safe to do so. Uh, people are probably more likely to get out their cell phone and record it. Uh, because if you interject in that, you might now become the target of that violence or unfair uh, treatment. And so as a police advisory committee, um, they decided that we need to establish uh, expectations for how we want people to act in our community and what is acceptable behavior. Uh, and so in order to start uh, changing that culture, uh, the PAC determined that we need to recognize appropriate behavior and that might encourage others in our community to behave the same way. So we have a subcommittee in the police advisory committee right now that is coming up with a community award uh, as a form of recognition so that when members of our community uh, go above and beyond and do something that serves others, uh, they won't be recognized by the police department, but they're going to be recognized by the police advisory committee, which is made up of members of our community. Great. Thank you. Um, let's let's move on to a couple other. There's another question that 
what can residents do to help with crime prevention? And I know one of those is SEPTED, which I believe is crime prevention through environmental design. Is that, am I saying that correctly? Does anyone want to talk about, Mark, I think you look impressed that I know what SEPTED stood for. <laughs> uh, do one of you want to talk a little bit about that? That's just, you know, cutting back the bushes in front of your windows and, and things like that. But I know there's more to it. Does anyone want to want to address that? So I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head when you talk about uh, through environmental design. It's, it's kind of making your property um, safe and and so you can view things that are happening uh, and so you don't have overgrown bushes that are blocking your view from maybe somebody approaching your house uh, that blocks your view of your neighborhood things like that it's to make it um, as like especially during the evening hours if you have exterior lights or motion sensors things like that cameras it's to make it as difficult as possible if somebody is out there targeting a house or a business for criminal activity, it's to make it that much more difficult for them to be secretive when they do that. And so that's when we talk about environmental design, uh, goes along those lines. And, and one of the things that, that I always tell people is, you know, and Chief talked about it a little bit, is that everybody has, you know, cell phones today. Um, and there's nothing, I don't see anything wrong with if you seeing something going on, if you don't feel comfortable stepping in to intervene with getting out and recording it. Um, and at that point, it's just be as good a witness as you can be. You know, whether it's, you know, yelling, letting them, you know, person, if it's an assault going on, just, you know, yelling at them, recording it, something to know that, hey, they're being watched, they're being recorded now. And that more than likely the police are going to be called and at, at least that way we have something to go on if we get in the area so it's you know if you don't feel comfortable getting involved just be a, as good a witness as you can be and mark i would i would add to that that uh if someone is going to utilize their cell phone that's not just for um civilians in our community if you think that there is something going on with one of our officers I would encourage that type of a recording as well. Madam Mayor? Yes. Uh, I would also in, encourage us as Pacific Northwesterners to get to know our neighbors and get out of our houses a bit. I know in our neighborhood, we're, we're to the place now, we're at the church, we're having to put up new alarm systems and lights and sirens and cameras, but we still have some of our and I, and I don't mean to demean them, but we have some aging uh, people, participants in our neighborhood that can use a little bit of extra support. And knowing that they have someone to talk to when they hear a bump at night, someone that will respond, uh, because though I believe we're making improvements in law enforcement, I cannot always trust that they will be there in time. So going back to the idea that uh, Officer or Commander Adams was talking about, we have to be prepared to, to love our neighbor as ourself. And that may mean knowing when some, if there's something suspicious at your neighbor's house, call the police, don't wait till they get home. Cause we work, there's a 24 hour work cycle now. We have to be willing to respond. My next door neighbor or the neighbor across the street from us, um, there were some individuals trying to break into their uh, backyard and they kept using the fence. So I came over and just installed a quick lock and that problem stopped. Now, is that required? Only if we want to have safer neighborhoods. When I was growing up, everybody knew each other and if something was missing or something yeah. was out of place, we responded. That wasn't always a police matter. Now, the lines in Washington are a little bit different than they are in other parts of the nation, but we can do more since we know that there's a problem. We can't just sit back and point fingers and say the police aren't doing it and then watch our brothers and sisters down the street suffer. There's a lot that we can do just by getting out, getting visible, and being good neighbors. Taking, taking back our communities, I, I think is important. Um, I know growing up uh, that all of the neighbors were responsible for me. And if my behavior was out of line with what they expected or what they thought my parents would expect, they would tell me so. Uh, we, so many of us have, and especially in this last year or so, we, we've drawn inward and we forget that we are community. If, if my um, 
blurred background wasn't on, you would uh, see that I have three words that are written, uh, printed out and put up on my bookcase and it's compassion, accountability and community. And that is what in my office, we try to make every decision based on at least those three things, but always including those three things. Community has a responsibility. Uh, there has to be accountability to community. And, and while there are a lot of scary things going on in this world right now, we have to take back our own neighborhoods, our own communities. I'm not talking vigilantism. That is the last thing that I would ever recommend but we have to take back knowing one another, accepting that we are going to have differences and appreciate those differences and learn from one another. That is the only way we are going to make sure that we continue to connect and we continue to have a community. People talk about the good old days. Well, there are some things about the good old days that were good, and there are some things about the good old days that I would never want to go back to. And so we have to identify where we are now and how we are going to make the very best of what we currently have. And I think with that, I'm going to pivot a little bit to, to Commander Adams, and let's, let's talk about that national narrative right now, Commander. We know that police are not necessarily seen in the most favorable of lights. I, I would say over the years, the decades, there is this cyclical perspective on police, uh, on law enforcement and on, um, on how, how either law enforcement officers are embraced, revered, feared, hated, and it's a continuous cycle. So, if you can talk a little bit about, let's, let's bring it from that national narrative down to the Auburn perspective. How has Auburn been proactive in making changes in policing? I know we've talked about some of them, but how have we been proactive? And, and then talk about how, how are we doing that in communities of color as well? You know, we're uh, continuing to work on out, outreach programs. Um, we have a program that I'm working on with our CRT division that I don't want to tip my hand at yet because it's still in the works, but it's something that we're working on to get out there in the communities and work with people. Uh, you know, being a minority myself, it's important for me to relate to the, the communities of color. Uh, I have seen in my 15 years of this job, not, you know, I'm not going to paint everyone with a broad brush, but I get a lot of ridicule sometimes from the communities of color for being a black officer. I get called a sellout, a Uncle Tom, and other names that I will not repeat on a live stream with uh, you know people watching at home because I don't think it's professional and I think it's not necessary, but they get the idea. And so uh, myself and the other officers of color and even my white coworkers and everyone else here, we want to bridge that gap. Uh, one thing we worked on with the police advisory committee is that they asked for liaisons. And all the officers that volunteer to be in the late liaison all wanted someone different than them. No one wanted to be in their comfort zone or work with someone that looks just like them. I had eight officers alone argue to be the uh, liaison for the uh, African-American community because they want to learn. They want to understand. They want to be educated. And that's the thing that we're trying to do. We're trying to work with the community. And again, like I said, we're not perfect at it. I'm not going to act like we're not without mistakes, but we are open and willing to open communication. We want to talk with you. We want to work with you. We want to understand you. And we want you to work with us. We want you to have some grace and we will have some grace, but we want, we constantly strive to improve relationships with everybody. It's an uphill battle because there's a lot of distrust ac across the country. Uh, unfortunately, you know, law enforcement gets painted with a broad brush. There have been officers out there and, and, and everywhere that have done stupid things. You see it all the time in the news and the media. But there's also officers that do amazing things. There's officers that, you know, risk their lives for people. There are officers that give their, their last dollar to people that are in need. Um, and that's one thing we're hoping to do. I, I see a lot of the comments on Facebook and people have their opinions, and that's good. But we are willing to talk and work with you. We're not happy until you're happy. And people might think that we're not doing enough, but it's a process. And if they will give us, you know, the feedback, the tools and support, we're going to give it right back to you. 
because we all signed up and I see it all the time. That's the job we chose. It is. I selfishly chose this job. It's selfish because I selfishly said, I will give my life for people I don't know. I will give my life for people that don't like me. I will give my life for people that don't care if I make it home or not. And it's selfish because I leave behind a wife and two children if I do lose my life in this line of duty. But it's something I signed up for and it's not always respected. It's not always cared for. And again, I said, we're not perfect, but we are working to build these community relationships. We are working to build it. Like I said earlier, when Pastor Lambert reached out to me, our initial conversation was how to have good interactions with police and people of color in the community. That was a 15 minute conversation because we spent the next two hours and 45 minutes talking about the advisory committee. And that's what become, became of that. And so if this one man, Pastor Lambert, could come down to our department and say, hey, let's have a talk and started something amazing. We could continue to do that if people are willing to, to communicate with us and give us ideas. We're not the smartest people in the world. I know that. I, we know. But you know what? We are in the culture and we work in this department. We don't always see through the community lens. And we want your feedback, your input, so we can see through that lens. We work on our training. We have uh, diversity training. Uh, I mean, we have a DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion manager for the city. I personally reached out to her. She didn't reach out to me. I reached out to her and said, hey, I want to work with you when it comes to hiring minorities and maintaining, or excuse me, retaining minority employees. I reached out. The police department reached out because we want to get better. We started to talk with a cop because we want to get better. The PAC, because we want to get better. And so I... Um, you know, like I said, we have training, we have diversity training, we have anti-bias training that was put on hold due to COVID, but that's amazing training that was taught at the CJTC, and we're constantly looking to get better. Uh, you know, we have thick skin, and we get a lot of flack from people, but, you know, it's unfortunately something we're going to, going to deal with because we want to earn your trust, we want to earn your support, and we want to serve the community the way it's supposed to be served. Thank you, Commander Adams. That, that was said with a, with a great deal of conviction and and passion and compassion, and I appreciate that uh, because our community is becoming more and more diverse every year, and that is something that we should embrace. We should be proud of the fact that so many people want to call Auburn home, and Mark, along with what Commander Adams said about training, maybe talk a little bit more about how, how training has changed in recent years uh, because I know there were some questions about that. Uh, are we are we having training in, in how to deal, uh, how to interact with diverse populations? And then uh, I know Commander Adams also touched a little bit on hiring practices. And if you want to touch on that a little bit, and then uh, I'll ask Chief O'Neill to weigh in on that as well. Well, as far as training, you know, there's a lot of um, state mandated training that officers have to go through every year. Um, we try and schedule as many outside trainers um, to come in and, and speak to our officers because they bring a different perspective. Uh, we recently had to give him a little shout out, Aaron Quinones, Quinones, Quinones yes. Sergeant Q from uh, downtown, come and speak to our officers about uh, resiliency and kind of, you know, he gave a good example of his life story um, and what he went through, and it gives it helps gives the officers a little bit more perspective uh, on what people in the community have gone through, and kind of helps them during their interactions with people they don't know. And so, you know, we we go through the crisis intervention training um, that the, the state has mandated, but we kind of went a little bit more. Uh, we send our officer. Every officer has been through the 40 hour course where the state only initially required eight hours of it. We sent them through the, the long course and then they all have um, yearly refreshers that re they're required to go through. Uh, we've incorporated training. Um, uh, I believe that the Muckleshoot tribe itself provided a, a video training for us, just kind of um, information about the tribe. Um, you know, they are uh, mostly located in the south end of Auburn, and we have officers that mainly work the north end, so they may not work uh, on the reservation at all or with uh, tribal members a whole lot. So it gives them that perspective, um, you know, to see what the tribe's doing for uh, the people and, 
and things like that. So it, we're just trying to kind of broaden um, what officers may encounter on the street, give them some background of experience to go through. And so we do have, you know, three training days every month that's scheduled so we can get, um, you know, we have 118 officers that, that have to go through training. So we try and get them as much training as possible in-house. And then, you know, if we've taken the, the goal, if officers find a training outside the department um, that we feel is relevant to the mission of the police department, we'll send them to that training. We do have a pretty good budget that the city has given us to make sure that, that we can afford it. And some of that training is out of state. So they get kind of a national perspective on things. Um, you know, one thing I, I, I do want to point out is that the Northwest and especially Washington State, I think we're we're ahead of the curve when it comes to training nationwide. I think most law enforcement in the state is ahead of the national curve. Um, you know, we still have a lot of work to do, but, um, you know, I think the majority of officers, when we see things that go on nationwide, and a lot of it is you just, it comes back to lack of training that some of these other agencies give their officers. And so we we try and make sure that's a priority for our department. It's excellent. I think I think that is a good point to make as we talked a little bit about the, the national narrative. Um, all officers seem to be lumped together. And we know that that's not an appropriate way to, to do this, just like all people of color do not want to be lumped together, right? N not all women want to be lumped together as, as being the same way. So it's important that we remember that there are differences and we respect those differences. We, we try and do better as Commander Adams said, we're not perfect. We want to do better. We want to be better. And so uh, I, I really appreciate that perspective. And, and I asked that question probably a couple of years ago to, to Chief about why, what are the issues? Why, why are these things going on? Some of them from um, lack of training as, as Chief O'Neill was telling me that in some parts of our country, they go through an initial training that might be with a private company uh, when they're hired on as officers, and that may be a majority of the training they receive for their entire career. And so when I when I heard the, the discrepancies between that training in other parts of the country and the training that we have in the state of Washington and in the city of Auburn specifically, because some of the training that is done goes above and beyond what the state requirements are, I think is phenomenal. Now, again, there will be those that think there need to be more training. There will be those that don't think we're doing enough. But I just want you to know, anyone who is listening, that our officers receive great training and will continue to receive great training. Uh, and Chief, for the officers, Mark mentioned that we have 118 uh, positions. We know that in the last year, maybe even two years, there have been some challenges in finding people interested in taking on uh, a career in law enforcement. Can you talk about that a little bit, what you're seeing, and then uh, we, we have done a great deal with diversity hiring, and that didn't just start. That's been over the last five or six years, I believe, that we had worked with a consultant on diversity hiring and changed some of our practices. So can you, can you tell me a little bit about what you all are seeing when you, when you have an entry level or a lateral officer opening? Yeah, so uh, traditionally, uh, you know, you can you can go and you can look at applicants and you can have them take a written test and come to an oral board and a polygraph and a psyche valve and all that good stuff. Um, but that's not going to prevent you from uh, having issues with officers down the road. And so one thing uh, that we really try hard to screen out is uh, we try and screen and look for people that have a good heart and a good mind. Uh, I don't think it matters how much training uh, you give somebody if they don't have a good heart and a good mind. And just like Commander Adams said, uh, if you're going to get uh, into this job, it is a selfless uh, profession. 
because there is no other job in the world where you are going to run towards danger when people are running away from it. And, you know, God forbid somebody goes into a school and there's an active school shooter. Uh, it takes a special kind of person that is willing to sacrifice themselves to run into that school to save kids. Um, and I know I would do it because in the jurisdiction where I live, I know officers would run in there and save my kids. Um, but we are in a time right now where the selflessness of this profession and the people that we need to get into it are lacking. Um, we look for people that have college degrees, that have some life experience or prior military experience. Uh, and it is a real challenge to attract those applicants to this profession right now when you turn uh, on the news and um, they are being uh, painted uh, with a brush. Nobody likes to uh, be painted as one large group, but uh, law enforcement as a whole is being painted as being part of the problem in our society. And so trying to attract uh, quality applicants uh, is a challenge right now. Um, but some things that we are doing is um, we are going to the PST uh, testing sites. Uh, they've been shut down because of COVID, but once they open up in person again, we had a lot of success uh, with recruiting diverse applicants. Uh, myself, Commander Adams, uh, some of our officers went and we just went right down the line and talked to every person that was in line uh, and tried to recruit them to the Auburn Police Department. Uh, and that paid off. They were, they were impressed. Uh, they liked the effort that a chief or a commander was there trying to recruit them to the Auburn Police Department and not the newest officer just off of probation who was making an appearance there. Um, we've also uh, created a mentoring program uh, where once somebody goes through and passes the oral board, they get paired up with somebody uh, that has a similar uh, background or idea uh, or similar hobbies. Uh, and that person uh, brings them on a ride along, uh, helps them through the hiring process, through the academy, through FTO, and they stay as a mentor until they get off probation. Uh, and Commander Adams runs that program. Um, the other thing that we do is we uh, put uh, diverse uh, evaluators on our oral boards um, so that when uh, somebody from a diverse background walks in to take an oral board, um, they feel like they can connect with somebody on that oral board and it takes the, uh, the, the stress and anxiety of the testing process away. Um, I've also extended that to our promotional exams. Uh, we have a sergeant's test that's coming up next week and the uh, panel for that is uh, diverse to match the diversity of our candidates. Um, and we've done that with uh, uh, our previous uh, commander's test as well. And so we think that's important to help uh, spread that diversity and try and attract uh, more candidates to the police department. And one thing uh, that I'm pretty proud of that I think is uh, a huge step forward for us is I just signed an agreement today with Green River Community College. Um, I took this idea to the PAC and I'm very proud of the PAC. The PAC came together and put the put the work into this, but we now have a scholarship uh, with Green River Community College uh, to try and recruit students from the Auburn School District in the criminal justice so that we can hire uh, diverse members of our community that were born and raised in Auburn or went to the Auburn School District or graduated from there or live in a city that now want to uh, get an education and get a college degree and hopefully uh, get into the criminal justice profession. And so this is the, uh, the first of um, many steps for that scholarship, um, but hopefully uh, that's going to be funded and we're going to see uh, students going to Green River um, uh, in September having uh, received that scholarship. That's great. I know Green River College is, is a great partner for us with the city and I appreciate that opportunity for a scholarship for, uh, for someone within our community to go into law enforcement. Because Chief, do you think that currently our department reflects our community? I think it does. I think uh, we can do a better job, um, but I have some uh, numbers here that I pulled and uh, looking at the demographics, 62% uh, of the population of Auburn is uh, white. So that means that 38% is made up of uh, other uh, ethnic groups. Uh, the Auburn Police Department has 138 total employees. 
uh, I took the current openings that we have out of there. Um, and uh, when you include, uh, when you add uh, females into the uh, diversity of the Auburn Police Department, because they're still an underrepresented group when it comes to the law enforcement profession, 34% uh, of our department uh, is made up of diverse um, members. Um, so that's, that's close, but I think we can do a better job. Um, but some steps that we've taken in this past year is we had uh, our first female ever in the history of the department attend SWAT uh, basic and graduate from SWAT school. Uh, we also have our first uh, female patrol dog handler with our first female canine uh, on the force. Uh, so I think those are uh, some steps uh, that we've taken in the last year towards uh, diversity. Um, I can also tell you that I have another diverse uh, candidate who I just reviewed his background today and we will be scheduling him for the final steps of the hiring process. Uh, he's a lateral from the Seattle Police Department. Um, and then uh, we've been doing oral boards for entry level candidates and Commander Adams told me uh, the interviews they did yesterday, I think they did 10 people and eight of them were uh, diverse applicants. So while I think we do match it by numbers, um, I think we're trending in a right direction. And I think we can, um, we're gonna continue to build on that as, as we continue to recruit and um, expand our uh, diverse recruiting efforts. That's great. And, and the hope is that Commander Adams and, and other diverse members of our police department feel as if, uh, feel embraced by members of the community. Um, I, I, it's not the first time that I've heard the story of some of the terms that uh, Commander Adams has been called. It, it is hurtful to hear that because I want our, um, our officers to be supported by this community. Um, and so we will continue to work in that regard. There's a question, Chief, of what are you doing to encourage women to be part of the force? Uh, what about helping make them feel safe, not just with the community, but within the police force as well? And so I, I think you you were touching on that, but if, if you wanna talk about that, I know we don't have any females uh, in our sergeant ranks or above, but you and I have, have talked about that and, and what our goals are moving forward. But if you wanna touch on that maybe a little bit. Yes, one thing uh, that we're doing is um, for sergeant promotional exams, uh, if we have a female uh, candidate, we're gonna make sure we have at least one female evaluator. Um, we are also, uh, we created a program for one, three and five year goals. You know, I believe that you cannot, uh, you can't start training your future leaders the day they put on stripes and become a sergeant. You need to identify your leaders early and you need to start sending them to that training and preparing them for that role uh, so that they're successful and they get there. And we have uh, several uh, females right now that are young in their career in the department, um, but it's only gonna be a matter of time until they uh, get a few more years under their belt or they decide uh, I'm gonna uh, bypass uh, maybe going to detectives or doing some other specialty assignment and stepping into that uh, leadership role. Um, we, we're a very young department and the talent is there and, it's, uh, and the skill is there and it's only gonna be a matter of time until uh, we promote our first female sergeant. Thank you. And, and part of that question was feeling safe within the department itself. And Dan, I think that's part of what the McGrath report uncovered and the work that you have been doing since that initial McGrath report when you inherited that is, is working on uh, safety within the department and having officers feel like they can report misconduct or if they were, if they're feeling like they're not being supported in any way. And uh, I, I think that you have done a great job of, of turning around that culture as, as has all of your leadership team. Uh, it's important that our officers know that they, that they can take their issues to their leadership and feel as uh, feel that they are heard. Yeah, part of uh, changing the culture is 
uh, early on uh, established uh, expectations uh, for all of us and especially the leadership team. And part of those uh, expectations are holding each other accountable. And early on, um, we had some incidents uh, within the department where we quickly uh, held people accountable and that sent a message and kind of uh, let people know uh, under the new uh, leadership of the department, um, things that um, maybe were not addressed or as taken as uh, seriously as they should have been in the past was no longer going to be the case. Um, and so early on, we had some issues that came up and we held those uh, people accountable, reinforced those expectations. And at the same time, uh, we have reinforced uh, positive behavior and recognize those who are engaging in the type of conduct that we expect from our, our officers. And uh, it, it was pretty surprising at how quickly uh, we were able to uh, change that culture and also reinforce uh, not only my expectations, but the expectations that command staff have for our officers and how we treat each other and professionalism, professionalism is one of our core values and what that truly means. And that doesn't just extend uh, to the people in charge, that extends to everybody up and down uh, the chain of command. Excellent. And Chief, there was also a question when we were talking about uh, fitness for duty that uh, how, how do you, after an officer is hired, how do you continue to make sure they are fit in mind and heart for the role? Yeah, so our officers uh, have always done a uh, fantastic job of holding uh, each other accountable out in the field when they engage in inappropriate uh, conduct that is not acceptable as a police officer. Um, I know there's a lot of talk about uh, the new uh, legislative reform for duty to intervene. Well, we have never had a problem as police officers uh, holding somebody else accountable who is engaging in unethical uh, misconduct as a police officer. But where we haven't always done uh, a good job at that is uh, recognizing when officers are maybe um, not dealing with things so well outside of the job. And so part of our wellness program and part of ABLE is recognizing um, when, when we're struggling uh, with, with the things that are going on in daily lives. You know, we all come to work as police officers, but we all have spouses at home. We have kids at home. We have bills. We have finances. We have uh, all the things that everybody in our community deals with. And sometimes officers bring that baggage to work. And so with the ABLE program, uh, we're teaching each other to recognize that and hold each other accountable uh, and intervene in that uh, area to get them some help with the peer support or get them to the employees uh, assistance program. Thank you. There was uh, also a question and, and then we'll, we'll start to wrap up here, but, uh, and I, I wanna, as we began talking about the McGrath report, I wanna end on the, on the draft of the follow-up, but uh, there's a question and I want you to all, I want you to answer this honestly, uh, and the question, and it can be of any of our police personnel, do your officers feel supported by our city? How is the morale in the Auburn PD? And I think, Dan, that will, that will be addressed in your discussion of the McGrath report. report. But then there was the follow-up of, and when I say city, I mean by the elected officials. So uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to be kind just because I'm here. Be honest about your opinion on whether the police department is supported by the, uh, by the council and the mayor. Well, I don't want to steal the thunder. I see Commander Adams turned on his camera. Do you, <laughs> you want to take that, Commander Adams? Oh, sure. If you give me the floor. Uh, you know, Mayor, and it's not just because you're here, but uh, I've been here under two mayors, you and uh, Pete Lewis, and you and I have had conversations. I have seen you in this police department multiple times. I've seen you on the streets and you wave at us. You actually give us the time of day. Uh, I've always felt supported by you and able to talk to you openly, honestly, and I appreciate that more than anything. Uh, I have felt at times that uh, other members of council have not supported us as much. 
Uh, I have not seen, I've seen a handful of them here at the department, maybe doing a walkthrough or meeting with us. Uh, we've extended opportunities for them to come and meet us and see us and get to know us better. Uh, I've presented at city council where I felt like uh, other members were more concerned with their, their phone than they were about what we were trying to talk about. And it's, it's kind of frustrating. And because, you know, there are elected officials that we have to answer to. And I just wish that we got more support on that front. Is it a popular thing to say? Probably not. Will I ever become chief of police? Eh, I doubt it. But facts are facts. Uh, I have to say, uh, you've done a great job of showing us support, and I appreciate that. And I, I wish your uh, fellow council members would show the same, um, I don't know, uh, initiative to come and speak with us and hang out with us. I mean, one of the, we've invited them to trainings, and the only one that showed up, uh, I'm not going to name him because I don't know if he you know, is watching or not, and I don't want to embarrass him, but he showed up to our training day, and he had a blast, and he brought light refreshments. So we really enjoyed having him. But... Um, you know, we are a city. We, I mean, you know, we have people chiming in and giving us ideas and stuff like that. But, you know, uh, the people that they elect, I wish they had more of a relationship with us so we could all, you know, continue to work together because it's all kinds of layers to the city. And if all the layers are working together, we can be amazing. And I, last thing I'll say, and I'll get off my soapbox, one of the members of the PAC, uh, Ms. Carlo, she said on the, at the first meeting, she wants Auburn to be the model city for everyone else to follow. And the PAC was the start. And the support from you is another start. Uh, promoting Chief O'Neill and the other things we have in place. This town hall, those are the steps in the right direction. And I hope we continue to make these steps moving in the right direction that we get quicker and start jogging, running, and sprinting in the right direction and show the rest of the world or anyone who wants to care and look at us that Auburn is doing what we can every way, shape, and form to be the best city, and that means police department, community, and city council that the country has. Thank you, Commander Adams. Thank you. And uh, Chief, if, if you want to wrap up with a, with a few thoughts about the, the draft McGrath report. Yeah, so the uh, preliminary results of the draft report, as I said, when we started this, uh, showed that 85% of the people um, employed by the Auburn Police Department uh, prior to being taken over as chief didn't, uh, they had concerns about the leadership of the agency and the direction uh, that it was going. Uh, the early numbers coming back are that now 80% of the employees of the police department believe in the leadership of the organization and the direction that it is going. And I have to give all that credit to the command staff. Um, I think the only thing that I have changed is I have given them the autonomy to do their jobs and be leaders and make decisions and let them know that I believe in them and that they are in their position for the right reason. And they're the ones that go out and make it uh, happen each and every day. And that filters down to our sergeants and down to our officers. Um, and so I don't think I came in here and waved any magic wand to make that huge change other than letting them know um, that I believe in them and give them the autonomy to do the job that they were hired to do. Um, the other early results that have come out of uh, the McGrath report are that um, our employees believe that there's more accountability now um, as we hand out more uh, discipline that is appropriate for the conduct that officers are engaging in. Uh, previously, uh, in most years, uh, the, the most issued discipline was always coaching and counseling. Uh, last year in 2020, uh, my first complete year as chief, the highest uh, uh, amount of discipline that was handed, handed out was a, uh, the most common was a written reprimand. Um, we also demoted one person um, and we uh, terminated uh, another employee for misconduct and we also uh, suspended uh, an employee. Um, but the officers wanted more accountability. Uh, and so we've given that. Um, as a result of uh, turning around the culture and the leadership of the organization, um, we had a 50% increase in accommodations that we've given out to our employees. Uh, and likewise, we've decreased the number of internal investigations that we've had to do by 50%. But we've increased the number of inquiries that we do by 52%. So that means uh, our officers are engaging in less misconduct, 
that our supervisors are looking into the conduct of our employees to make sure that they're within the parameters of our expectations. Um, that's increased by 52% since 2019. Um, so I think uh, the, the path uh, that we were on and our goals um, when I took over as chief, uh, I think we're going in the right direction and we're making progress, um, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And we also need to, uh, you know, now's not the time to take our foot off the gas. Uh, we need to continue with what we're doing uh, to ensure that uh, not only do we improve it, but that we at least um, maintain. Um, you know, when you look at uh, organizational culture, it's easy to make changes, uh, especially um, you know, when 85% of the employees don't buy into the leadership of the organization, it's easy to fix that. But can you maintain it? That's the real challenge. And that's what we uh, need to continue to work on as we move forward. Thank you, Chief. Um, and earlier we talked about how you were going to be able to connect with Colby and others. I think there's a slide available if that is, there we go. Contact APD at policeapd at auburnwa.gov. And on Monday night, July 12th, as I mentioned earlier, if you could, uh, you'll be able to tune in to watch the city council study session, youtube.com backslash or slash, I never get that right, watch Auburn. And you'll be able to hear about the body camera proposal, uh, more about the pack. You'll hear about updates to legislation and what that means to our community and how our officers will continue to provide the very best that they can for this community. I want to thank everyone on the panel tonight. I think this was some lively discussion. Some of it a bit uncomfortable at times, but none of us went into tonight thinking it was going to just be a cheerleading session. That's not realistic. That's not our community, but we wanted to provide honest information to you about our department and changes that are being made and some of the opportunities for engagement with our community. I thank you all for being here. Some of you, uh, so we have Chief Dan O'Neill, we have Assistant Chief Mark Callier, we have Commander Christian Adams, we have APD PIO Colby Crossley, and we have the amazing birthday boy, Pastor Lashund Lambert with us this evening. Thank you so much for your time, for your willingness to give to this community. For those of you that are online that watched, thank you for sharing your evening with us. I hope that we were able to answer your questions. If not, please reach out so that we can. And for some of you that know me, you know that I like quotes. So I am going to leave you on one final note, and this is a quote from Socrates. The secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building on the new. So here's to all of us spending all of our energy building on the new, making Auburn the best place for us to live, work, and enjoy our time away from work. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you at our next town hall or before that at a council meeting, at the grocery store or anywhere else that you would like to connect. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.